Hello, friends, and welcome back to Stories About Entitled People. Let's start our video with a story from the web industry. But before we begin, don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you're new here and turn on notifications so you don't miss a new video every single day. Here we go. Hello, is it me you're looking for? I'm in-house IT, among other things, for a very small company. Like some days, there's not even four people in the building small. But the boss, the owner, while a complete troglodyte, likes to keep up appearances and play in the Fortune 500 infrastructure pool. So where two copies of QuickBooks and five licenses of Office 365 would suffice, we have a server rack pushing six USD digits and annual software licensing in the mid five digits. That's just some background for the mindset. So we do take a good bit of inbound sales calls. Not long ago, we were still on a 20-year-old Nortel PBX phone system that routes regular old LAN telephone lines to the correct handset in the offices. Well, one day the boss walked into a peer's business and saw a single receptionist handling multiple inbound calls using snazzy color touchscreen IP phones. OP, I need quotes for an IP phone system stat. Okay, whatever. Phones work fine now. Yeah, they're old. But the only logged downtime has ever been when the power goes out for more than three hours, as long as the installed UPS can hold them online. Not to mention you, Mr. Troglodyte, have been using this system exclusively for 20 plus years. Do you really think you're up to the task of learning this? Sure thing, boss. Fast forward through the months of agonizingly tedious vendor interviews full of impossible what-if scenarios posted by Mr. Trog. The two false starts with different vendors where contracts are signed, hardware slash software slash entire systems are deployed, only to be returned slash canceled due to non-performance. Mr. Trog's definition, not any reasonable definition. Finally, at great expense and expenditure of time, we arrive at a system that's acceptable to Mr. Troglodyte. Never mind that this new system is merely an IP version of the system we already had. Absolutely no addition of features only the addition of training to learn a completely different way of managing the same tasks. But wait, maybe not every feature. This new system lacked the ability to forward inbound calls in a very confusing, quirky manner as boss required. How do I know? I called their support and went through two tiers before I got an engineer who told me in no uncertain terms that the specific thing he wanted could not be done with the current version of the software. But don't take my word for it, boss. Go ahead, go over my head on my day off and call a salesperson who'll be your yes man. You're the boss, you're right, I'll do it. I've configured the system as directed specifically by you, Mr. Boss, to have all inbound calls ring the main four to five handsets. After four rings, any inbound call will route specifically to your cell phone. Never mind that you required the phones to route a different way completely at six rings, you'll never get to the fifth. And never mind that at eight rings, you specified that it go to a pre-recorded voicemail. You're a mad genius. This is going to work beautifully. So morning of cutover from PBX to IP, I grab my cup of coffee and a bag of popcorn and let the festivities begin. Of course, boss is late to the mandatory 9 a.m. briefing slash training slash demo. Calls in about 10 a.m. from his cell phone. Frontline sales is already on two active calls glances at the caller ID and sees it's just boss. Let's it ring. Goes four rings and guess what? Right back to the phone he's on, right into his own voicemail box. Think I didn't see that coming? Oh hell, I did, I was counting on it. Now in rapid succession, three more quick calls. I know his face is red as a beet. On the third call, Frontline didn't let it go to four rings. They probably should have, they got an earful. I was sitting grinning from ear to ear just out of line of sight, but well within earshot. I couldn't hear what he was saying, but I didn't have to. I won't bore you with the rest of the details, suffice to say, we no longer have the lines forward to his cell phone at four rings. Odd how that took 48 hours to provision through on a supposedly instantaneous web interface admin panel. Strange that. And our next story. You try to avoid responsibility? See you in court. We, husband and I, moved to the city and rented a house in an older middle-class neighborhood. Every day, regardless of the weather, I took my dog on the same 1.5 mile walk when I got off work. I met a lot of people in the area this way and also their pets. 
I got to the point where I would say hi to the dogs by name and they didn't bother us. So I'm on my daily walk with my golden retriever and notice a house down the street has a dog in the backyard I've never seen before. She didn't bark or fuss so I didn't worry about it until we were on our way home and this dog is sitting in the front stoop out front and isn't in the fenced in backyard anymore. The kicker is the front yard slash stoop area has those invisible fence dog and training flags so i'm skeptical because i know from experience that those will never stop a dog who really wants to leave the area i take appropriate precautions putting my dog on the opposite side of this random mutt and hold his leash a six foot one so he's walking right next to me finally i keep my eyes on this dog the entire time we walk past the house we make it past the house and onto the neighbor's stretch of sidewalk without incident that's when it hits me. A hundred pounds of English Mastiff barrels into my leg and heads straight for, you guessed it, my dog. The Mastiff is snarling and biting and my dog's trying so hard to run away, but I know I can't let go of the leash. If he runs, it'll just be worse. So I manage to grab the Mastiff's collar in one arm and lock my elbow to hold it there. I do the same to my dog and just hold them apart. I didn't realize it at the time, but I was screaming the entire time this was happening and neighbors start rushing out of the houses around us, but no one from the Mastiff's house. Someone grabs the Mastiff and puts her in the backyard while I'm getting talked down by another neighbor. I'm literally sobbing, looking over my dog's face with by the light on my phone when the dog owner pulls into the driveway. She's my age and immediately freaks out when I tell her what happened. I ask for the rabies vaccination documentation and city licensure, and she brings it out. Finally, I'm calming down, turns out my golden was fine, and we're talking about how much we love our dogs and how she's saving up for training. The Mastiff has a rescue with a bad past when, I crap you not, the Mastiff opens the backyard gate and skulks down the driveway. Get in the backyard, the owner shouts at the Mastiff. I bet you can guess how that went. The Mastiff goes right for my golden and pins him to the ground. Have you ever heard a dog scream? I have. So what do I do? I jump right on top of it all, because my dog's been there for me for a lot of crap, and he's a pansy butt and needs mom to step up sometimes. The Mastiff has her jaw locked around my dog's head, so I wrapped my fingers under her jaw and into her mouth and clamped down on her tongue and teeth until she let go. The nice neighbor helps the owner drag the dog inside. I'm crying again, and this time my dog has cuts across his face. They're around his eyes, under his lips, and down his cheeks, but he seems okay otherwise. No eye damage, thank God. And as soon as he sees the Mastiff is gone, he's looking to get belly rubs from the people assembled. I tell the girl that we seem okay for now and I'll let her know if anything changes and head home. Cue the adrenaline dump. We get home and my husband has gone on a business trip, so I start flipping out. So I call my very first superhero, my dad. He helps talk me down enough so that I can clean my golden's face and get him wrapped up in a blanket and settled that's when I realize that my jeans are filthy and have blood on them, so I go to change into comfy pants so we can get some serious snuggles going on when I realize that I'm the one bleeding on the same leg that was next to and facing the Mastiff. Well crap, I've got a puncture wound and a bite bruising around my thigh, and now blood is running down my leg, so I call my dad back. Husband was in a different time zone and literally could not answer, and we decided to call the Ask a Nurse number run by our insurance. Now, I really didn't want to go to urgent care as it's 8-ish at night now, but apparently dog bites are a huge effing deal. So I interrupt my sister's evening class at grad school and she comes to take me to the ER, leaving my brother-in-law with my golden so he wouldn't get upset and be alone. Yeah, I'm that dog mom. I let the other owner know about the puncture on my leg and that I was advised to get it checked out and we head out. Two hours later and I'm back at home with some takeout and antibiotics and we snuggle the hell out of my dog. Next morning, my dog goes into the vet, gets everything looked at as well, and I log the necessary reports with animal control. They get a small ticket and the Mastiff has to spend a week in house quarantine, but nothing major. My Golden has no repercussions. Fast forward to when my doctor's bill arrives. I deliver a copy to the Mastiff owner and advise she contact her renter's insurance because it should cover something that small, like $400. I bet Pro Revenge can guess what happens next. She refused to pay my bill and has her mom write a letter about how insurance rates in Obamacare mean that the bill was inflated. Oh no, she didn't. This is where I literally start Pro Revenge. I call my dad. Did I mention he's an attorney? 
We begin sending letters letting them know they can either pay or face a lawsuit. Still, they refuse to pay. We gave them so many chances, but after 18 months said F it and filed a lawsuit. Suddenly, they have an attorney too and really want to settle out of court for less than my hospital bill and vet bill. After I've already paid out of my own pocket, we decide after I've already paid out of my own pocket, we decide to screw them to the wall instead. Here's the thing though. From the second I got home after the bite, I saved photos of every bite mark, every bruise, the vet bill and doctor's bill, and what my dog looked like after treatment. He had huge bald patches, the cost of my antibiotics. I saved the letters and recorded the interactions between the Mastiff owner and myself. Why? Because I know how easily this crap can go wrong. I grew up on stories of it. Finally, our court date arrives and we submitted article after article into evidence and kept track of each individual filing fee. In the end, they had nothing to stand on. I was the only witness to the initial incident. They tried to say I was trespassing. How'd they know, since they weren't home? Also, I wasn't. They said my dog is the one that bit me. That's how come they didn't contact animal control and report it during the officer's investigation? They dragged it out for four hours until the judge threw the book at them for wasting the court's time and irresponsible pet ownership. The Mastiff owner paid all of my medical bills, the vet bills, the court fees, and emotional and physical damages to the tune of $1,000. The courthouse even validated my parking. A dog bites through your jeans and you don't notice till you get home? That's pretty metal. Hey guys, thank you all for watching the video. I'll see you in the next one.